Happy Monday. Everyone. I just realized I can get access to the Starbucks Wi-Fi from across the street from here. So maybe I'll just put this in there. <laughs> yes, the you just hit the jackpot. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, by the way, Bryce, thank you so much for trying that out. I like this so much more because my eyes <laughs> tend to drift up to either program or mm -hmm. this. I, I can't tell how I look when I'm looking down. At... Mm, you should look up. That's okay. that's why I had it a little lower, is because you, because I tend to you, I, you'll I, look I, up yeah, and down. But okay. what, what is this today? Well, then I'll 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 even when it's me here. If if you don't mind, put it on sure. me. Okay. So yeah, it's 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 hard to not look at Andrew and Justin down there. Uh, but uh, but I'll I'll just keep that up. You know, maybe we'll do a a, a sec uh, another copy of that monitor just barely above it, just so I can. There's something primal about just wanting to look in the eyes of who you're talking to. Weird. Weird. Because <laughs> uh, no, I... <laughs> uh, human move. Uh, <laughs> Very weird. I was try <laughs> trying to glimmer, glimmer you there. Because <laughs> I'll, I'll, I, I, maybe it's because I do the the Twitch streaming a, a, a good amount, but I'm pretty good at being able to just like, I don't know, either focus at a lens where no one's looking or look at myself in a, mo in a monitor. Yeah, and, and I suppose that'll be a stylistic thing that, that will evolve over time. But I, I know that, because you remember we get these comments on Modern Rogue where, the, where they're like, people were really angry. They're like, why aren't you talking to the camera? You, you're talking to each other and not the camera. And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, that's understandable. What I hate, and I hate, but just drives me nuts, is when somebody's talking and it's just them and a camera and over there, then they cut to the side angle of them talking. And I'm like, who's, whose point of view is this? <laughs> it's a, <laughs> this is what the side of my face looks like. <laughs> we do that for some yeah, of our ads and stuff. But yeah, it's, it, it, it's definitely like weird if you kind of mix the two metaphors well, for I, a long time. I suppose my theory, and, and uh, we don't want to, take forever on it but but like 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 right now uh it looked uh, if there was a third person between me and justin and we're talking to each other or, or the three of us right where where it's like you would not expect them you would not expect me to talk to justin like this like that would be very weird mm -hmm. in a in a in a real space conversation so i i, I tend to like the slightly off and it, and it works for justin and, and i on night attack because we're both, you know, angled in facing toward, or, mm -hmm. or me and Bryce right now. You know, if you, if you sure. cut to me and Bryce, like I'm looking at, you know, Bryce, either real or whatever. Yeah. Imagine the opposite of this. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I, I also think like people have, at least viewers like understand remote like recordings and stuff, especially now um, where you know they where it's even more like on its face like there's a whole frame and it never changes from the four up and everyone's looking into their cameras or into the computer because that's how they do their podcast whatever that podcast but, might be but then i guess like, I like, like in the, the cable the person oh I, I i was just gonna say like in the cable news era it would be three boxes of three people all staring into nothing you know and uh uh i don't know i i, I guess I, I i don't mind the idea of breaking that what were you gonna say andrew Oh, I just, I like the idea of like the person who still doesn't under, who, who tunes in and doesn't realize they're not talking to him. Like, hi, everybody. I'm Brian Brushwood. Let me tell you about some of the new things we're doing Modern Rogue. Tell me more, Brian. <laughs> uh, the, Brian, Brian, why won't you talk to me? There's a fantastic book that uh, remind me should be my pick for today. That uh, I think it's 20 years old now, but it's the DV Revel Rebels Guide, and uh, oh, yeah. they talk about uh, the conventions that are universally understood now and and he makes the example of you realize that if somebody from shakespeare's time had watched a movie and saw a crossfade they would not understand that as going to another location or mm -hmm. passage of time they'd say the fuck are they a, a ghost yeah. <laughs> like like i, I guess there's they're a, a ghost <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> there, there's a similar study on um uh on the effects of Zoom, uh, Zoom in as a as a storytelling uh, action. Oh, the punch For, in. Uh, well, or just just act, just zooming in general in in terms of early cinema, because I, I I don't remember. I believe it was a study that they did with with um, people in sort of third world countries where there was not a lot of cinema, and they had a 
uh, especially in early, early days, they had trouble reconciling uh, a zoom because if you do a pan, if you do a tilt, if you do uh, most camera actions, you can replicate. You 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 understand similar to how the human eye works in in on you know in the skeleton, uh, but zoom we don't have a human function of zooming. And so that would that would be something that would get that got audiences disconnected in a weird way. Well, and- you know, I wonder though that like, let's say just like some of the like the fade in you know in theater live theater there were versions of that though the fade out came from theater. The zoom would be weird, but sometimes when it's done right, you don't notice it though, because it's like you just keep focusing in. But like the '70s crash zooms, like yeah, you'd be like, what the hell? But well, and, and it makes me think of uh, uh, the pioneering you know uh, CGI uh, fake zooms that were used uh, uh, to convey like uh, the idea of a cameraman as as an actor or part of the storytelling. I really noticed it first in in The Shield where it's like uh, they very clearly choreographed on the script where it's like, I'm going to say this, say this, and then boom, and then what, and then this, and then yeah. uh, and similar, uh, you know, Firefly, it's like in a space battle, it's like, ah, it's hard to see, and oh, I'm getting in, you're in and out of focus. This is... Succession well, yeah, does the, that too. Doc- yeah, that was part of from the documentary style. Because that documentary, that was a thing because you'd have one camera often covering a topic and you just got to punch in right there to grab that sort of thing. Yeah. Oh, I guess, I guess that, that, that like, is... A good precedent explainer uh, because documentaries obviously existed uh, as far back as the 70s, I'm told. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Almost the 1870s. So yeah. <laughs> hey, Justin. What's up, fam? Double Justin. Oh, yeah, you got to meet yourself on Skype, Pim. Uh, hold on. Bam. Double Rookie Justin, mistake. double double Justin, double Justin, double double Justin. How is uh double how was your stream earlier, Jason? Good, good, good. Yeah. Uh you know, people are all fired up for whatever whatever this uh Republican convention's gonna be, and uh mm-hmm. we'll be covering it live tonight. Nice. Uh nice. there's so I was listening to some NPR stuff and uh they were they they were interviewing a uh musician. Uh, who's like, uh, oh man, the song, you know, they're like, so it was really interesting that after you sang your song, you said you should all vote. And he's like, yeah, man, because uh, uh, you got to vote, you got to vote, you got to vote. Uh, and, then, and then like the very last word is like, no matter who you like. And then, and then, and then they moved on. And I'm like, I get the impression that if I were to say, <laughs> say uh, I agree, I'm going to vote third party. I, I, I believe he would not be that's cool bro <laughs> like i mean well yeah this is this gets me into another just argument that gets increasingly unpopular uh the closer we get to election day but uh but yeah as as we've discussed before i i tend to i tend to despise the guise of just vote just vote just vote when it's like just say what you mean vote for my person right i like my person you should vote for my person like that's we, fine just be honest Ju- justin and i had a teacher i think you had madden too right of course uh, yeah we had this in john high school madden. we had the social studios yeah john madden he was he was, he was really great loud but great we had a, a teacher see the neutron game- is anyway. yeah, he gave like the the, <laughs> the 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 delay on opal is like huge so oh we're shit i'm sorry each other. yeah no no it's not your fault um he he gave like the greatest speech i ever thought about politics which was don't vote He's like, don't vote. He was just, I don't think he would give us today, but he's like, yeah, like most people are uninformed, don't know what they're talking about. Just don't vote. He's like telling a bunch of high school freshmen this. I was like, yes, yes, don't vote, everybody. Well, yeah, no, yeah. And his his, his point was, my vote's better the less you all vote. My vote matters more because I'm reading and I care about these things. And this is the issue, the issues that I care about. So honestly, I would. It would better me in every single way if you don't vote, and that was I I I love that he gave that speech to us too, and it's like, it 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 was politically formative. <laughs> I will say that. Well, and uh, I, I don't know, uh, not to get too deep in it, but it's and kind we should of, not get too deep. In it. Okay, it's kind of literally how our uh, country was founded is on the idea of you know, not everybody votes on everything, but instead. You select a person who you trust <laughs> and a group of people that you trust. But the problem is uh, we've seen that trust broken uh, a time or two. 
started yeah, with the I don't Romans. know. I, I think that there can be, I think saying the words that like, yeah, as many people as possible should go vote, at least in like major, right? I mean, you're describing a republic. I mean, we that's the, what our democracy is. Uh, I think you, you I think should have everybody thinking about who they trust. Yeah, you yeah. should you should at least seriously consider or like have a system. I don't know. That's why I'm I'm very like let's just do the popular vote so that we don't have all of the crazy mechanisms of the electoral college uh, yeah. because there are a lot of well, that's it. That's a lot a of unanswered story, questions though. about <laughs> the results of those, huh? Well, at least we know this will be the simplest election we've ever had. <laughs> yeah. Two thousand all over again. I'm, calling it. I'm not the first one to call it, but yeah, it's, it's like two thousand, two thousand 2, times two thousand. I'm expecting uh, th- this will be a revolutionary year because the lawsuits will start before election day, even like like somebody goes ahead and just files the the lawsuit before the election even starts. Oh yeah. All right. Well. Uh... Why don't we file our lawsuit after the podcast starts? You guys want to start the podcast? Hells yeah. Yep. All right, Andrew, I'm going to count you in. In three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello, friends. Brian Brushwood. Yeah, I'm here with my co-host, Edward Furlong's hair from Terminator 2. And Mr. Bryce Castillo, whose hair are you sporting, Bryce? Uh, gosh, I don't know. It's such a mess because it's in a medium length, so it's not long yet, but it's definitely not short. I don't know. Uh, I, 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 don't know I feel like uh, we're definitely e- even two years from now. Uh, let's say let's say there's a vaccine and COVID, we're not really scared of. Uh, there are so I think there are so many men that are taking this advan- this opportunity. To, to get over the hump, because we all have the excuse of why middle length hair looks silly on us, uh, and then we'll be over the hump. I, I think I think long hair is going to be like, I, I if you're looking for an entrepreneurial suggestion, invest in men's long hair, uh, make your own men's long hair company. Uh, Combs fact, for long hair. In fact, call it, call it shampoo that. for long hair. <laughs> yeah, because I, I think I think it's going to be a novel thing. I I grew out my hair in high school, and uh, there's some dorky phases that you go through as you get to long hair. But um, uh, there's a bunch of people, uh, men over 20, who have never grown their hair out, who are making the decision to do so now because of of you know it's acceptable. I know that the longer my hair grows, the more I look like Sideshow Bob. I know that so. the longer my hair grows, the stronger I get. <laughs> Why have you waited so long? What are you? What? I know. Yeah. When did you not learn this? <laughs> exactly. That was really stupid for you to have short hair your entire life. <laughs> yeah. Geez. Uh, gentlemen, this is my latest update on Space is Still Weird. Oh, thank goodness. Oh, good. Good. Still weird. So uh, what I love about science and, you know, of course, uh, you know, like the the expression often, the science is never settled. Sometimes you have a pretty damn good idea. Like that part won't change. But some things we just don't know. Remember our interstellar visitor, Omamamamamu? Yeah, yeah. That uh, that was a giant uh, 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 pipe uh, uh, cigar that that tumbled around that looked like um, uh, uh, 2001. And was so, from outside of our solar system. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, so, they, yeah that, that's the picture. Yeah, so like we were pretty sure, and again, that's the artist rendering of what this thing looked like. I have no idea. You know, we, we've got like a, a radio signature of this thing, but it came from from its orbit. Orbit says, "Hey, this thing probably came from outside of our solar system." That's the only thing that makes sense. Great, and then there was a weird way in which it was moving, which it appeared to accelerate, which would be kind of odd because why would this thing accelerate? And there are all sorts of suggestions about this. Then one of the things that came up was like, well, maybe it's like part of a comet and that was sort of an outgassing effect that was affecting that. And so that seemed like a pretty good kind of, you know, explanation for that was that, you know, that the, it's wonky acceleration was due to some sort of you know, natural phenomenon. Oh, it- uh, 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 just just so i understand uh, the uh, uh, so so like uh, there's a pocket of ice in there and 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 now it's 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 shooting out like a propellant basically yeah or just just so- one side of it 
you know, one side of it is having this effect where it's sort of like, you know, causing it to radiate outwards, which is causing that effect. And that seemed to be kind of like, okay, cool. And then people were like, yeah, like it would be, I don't know, maybe it's, it's solid, you know, it could be solid hydrogen, you know, and that would work. So like, okay, we think we have, I I assume that solid hydrogen is so in order to stay solid, it has to be so cold that even being in the far reaches of the, you know, uh, solar effect, all of a sudden it's warm enough to start, you know, sublimating or whatever. Yeah, well, hold on a second, Brian. I'm trying to see if I find your name on this research paper. Because... Wait, 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 did I just, oh, God dang it. I... Huh, wait, wait, no, Brian, they don't credit you. Uh, but yes, actually, <laughs> but, but, well, but somebody else said that was the paper that was like, hey, listen, we think that this thing could be doing that. But that somebody else said, all right, Brian, at, at all. Um, <laughs> There's so much the heat from all that starlight out there, though. Even the starlight out there should boil the thing off. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, so in your face, like, yeah, okay, okay, Mister Johnny Starlight, affecting this thing, it's gonna boil off. And so, no, no, it's wrong. It's alien. Uh, uh, that is really weird. <laughs> um, I have no idea. Uh, do you guys want to play a Price Is Right game of of what? what the temperature for solid hydrogen has to be. Cause I, uh, I would guess like, uh, 30 Kelvin. One Wait. Kelvin, one Kelvin. God damn it. Uh, all right. <laughs> I, I'm assuming Andrew already, already knows. I'm looking at it right here. Oh, so. okay, okay. I mean, oh yeah, guys, I'll play this game too. <laughs> um, What's your guess? Uh, I'm going to say 14.01 degrees <laughs> above absolute zero. You know, oh, like you just got $500. You got ding, 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 right on the nose. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So the one, some researchers said, hey, we think maybe it's solid hydrogen, and then that's what's causing it. Another researcher like, no, even the starlight out there would cause this thing to evaporate, particularly if this thing had been out there for 40 million years. That's another thing, too, is like they've even got an idea of what part of the sky they think it formed them, this sort of like, you know, this – gaseous accretion disk where maybe this thing formed of and got ejected from and one of the things that we try to bring up a lot here in weird things when it comes to space is that it's not like the galaxy is static it's not like our solar system is just hanging out here our solar system since the formation of the earth has made like a dozen trips around the galaxy passing other star systems and stuff sometimes other stars have passed straight through our solar system and everything gets disrupted things are in motion there's more data out now that there are more rogue planets than stars, meaning there are more big wow. giant planets out there just drifting through space, but because they're not close to a star, we don't know they're there. I, I think you just blew my mind. A star passed through our solar system? Yeah. I, I, like um, uh, inside the Oort cloud or... or... Uh, in, it can historically, there been you know they believe that there's examples where stuff like that has happened. Wow, that's remarkable. And I and and I guess that that would be a reshuffling of all the planets, right? And so uh, um, a few of them smash into each other and then reform. Not necessarily. Okay, so here's an example from astronomy: wandering stars. That God. Bryce, it's fast. <laughs> I, so for our audio listeners, I'm like typing this up, and Bryce has got the article already up. Like he just this is a total guess on that one. <laughs> oh, brag Shut about up. it. This is this is like when we find out that Bryce is an oh, alien with superpowers. Oh. When we find out Bryce has, we're like, yeah, it was in front of us all along. Though. Like Bryce is the one who is aware of the simulate. We're at Bryce's video game simulation, and this is how oh, he knows yeah. it. You know, this is a thousandth trip through here. I'm, I have to distract oh. you from Oumuamua. Take our journey. <laughs> Prices. Oh well, guys. Let me. Ah, oh, Bryce, why did you choose? <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is astronomy.com. Wandering stars pass through our solar system surprisingly often. That's amazing. And uh, if it did it tomorrow, it probably wouldn't even. Uh, 
crack the top 10 of weirdest things that's happened in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the most the most famous these stellar interlopers is called Schultz's Star. I know nothing. <laughs> uh, the small binary star system was discovered in 2013. Its orbital path indicated that about 70,000 years ago, it passed through the Oort cloud, the extended sphere of icy bodies that surrounds the fringes of our solar system. Wow. Some astronomers even think Schultz's Star could have sent some of these objects tumbling into the inner solar system when it passed. Wow. But they're pretty fast and rapidly moving, so it's not like it lingers long to have too much of an impact. Um, man, the, uh, I, I listen to all this, and I think of us as uh, this tiny little Petri dish, and it's like uh, and I remind myself that, that life and nature is the aberration, is, is, is the, uh, is the uh, for, forgive me, the cancer on what otherwise, like the natural order of things, is rocks bang into each other and stars uh, do fusion. The unnatural order of things is that life evolves. And for me, I choose life. I want to get the hell out of this Petri dish. I want to infect as much of this dumb universe as we possibly can. That, that's yeah. terrifying. Wait, Bryce, scroll down to the image of there, because when this thing happened 70,000 years ago, it would have been visible from Earth. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to caption this oh, for you here. wow. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> what the ugh? <laughs> we got this, like you know, early human with a spear, you yeah, know, staring up at this thing, going, "What the hell?" And I thought zero 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 twenty was weird. <laughs> and he's looking up at this red star, uh, saying, "Like, I bet that's a major plot point of the book." That what? Nope, they never mentioned it again. I guess met dragons are <laughs> yeah. something. Okay. That was a, that yeah, was a reference so, uh, to the Red Comet. Yeah, terrifying. Did somebody point out, yeah, at some point, our Milky Way and Andromeda are going to pass through each other, but we may just keep moving through. And, the, you know, some point said, like, because stars are so diffuse, like, there may be no collisions, except perhaps with, you know, at the center of our galaxy, we've got a big-ass black hole. And so there's a chance that that might suck some stuff into it and cause a little disruption, but... You know, yeah, you could pass one galaxy through another one and be like, "Hey, what's going on? Hey, dudes, what's going on?" Wow, I guess that uh, it would be it would be a bit like um, uh, think of it as as if if you and a friend are blowing out uh, birthday candles that are about a foot or two to uh, the left or right of each other. Like your your breaths don't you know meet each other, and then suddenly you know, cancel each other out. They just pass through each other. And, and then one of you blows out one birthday candle and the other one blows out the other birthday candle. Oh, well, yeah, because, like, you know, when our nearest star is like three and a half light years away, that's long, That's far. That's really far. I mean, yeah, statistically, I'd be interested to see like what would be the probability. Even then, yeah, I think probabilistically of something lighting could be very low. But again, and when you come to like, the center with like the big ass black hole there. It was like, ah, uh, you know, would that cause a problem as it goes from one point to the next? I don't know. I'm just a podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> but as a podcaster, we depend upon your support. It's not like we can write to like the National Science Dudes Foundation and no. say, hey, National Science Dudes, fund us. <laughs> can, can we, can we no. establish the National Science Dudes Foundation? Well, we, we tried, Brian. <laughs> we tried writing to the National Science Dudes Foundation, and they said, sorry, dudes, you don't qualify. <laughs> and, and that's why we had to go to patreon.com slash weird things. It's where you can support this program. Head on over there right now. Make sure you get this Monday content as fast as possible. Any level gets the custom RSS feed. Put that in any of your podcatchers and you will get the bonus material. No passwords, no signups. It is just that simple. So, hey, uh, computers are really weird and they're very clever and they do interesting things. Do you remember a while ago there was somebody realized that you could make a copy of a key from a photo of a key? Oh, yeah. <gasps> Oh, I know where this is headed. Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> I would. Uh, oh my gosh, you're good. Take it, take it, Brian. Take it. Um, uh, somebody sent me an article. Okay, so uh, uh, first of all, if you're a keysmith or a, a locksmith, you can just look at a key and say, and and you you see the numbers. You're like, uh, okay, that's a seven pin, one pin, four pin, two pin, and and you just have to know it. And in fact, on hacking the system, 
we talked about uh, just to, or, or act, oh my God, that's Modern Rogue. Um, uh, so on Modern Rogue, we talked about take a photograph of a key and Bill Duran showed us how to uh, uh, use a 3D printer to print out, you know, cause again, all you gotta do is kind of snap it and correct it or whatever. But uh, uh, Andrew, if I'm not mistaken, there are other ways to sense how things are structured. Yes, Brian, this is true. <laughs> One of those ways is apparently you can use the sound of a key in a lock. Wow. Just the sound of it going click, 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 click. Because again, like Brian points out, keys adhere to a standard format. And so it, it even though if they were wildly random, it would be different, but they're not. So what you just have to do is sort of like high click, low click, side click. Oh, okay. We know what your key is now. So I guess so. it would it would kind of be similar to like you being able to know what phone number was dialed by back in the day where they actually made the 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 tones you could you know just know what those tones are and know what the number was like like yeah. that that's that's a similar idea yeah uh uh although that that conceivably could be done just with your ears i'm assuming that this solution uh uh, you, you there, there's some, yeah, there we go. We're looking like at a, at a spectrograph thing that, uh, wow, it, it does look astonishingly clear when you look at it, the spectro spectrograph of, of the sound. So it's very obvious where there are clicks of each, uh, of each, of each bittering, I think is goes in. And then I guess they use the, the frequency response to tell how, uh, I don't know how, how high or low that, that spike is. That's so amazing. Now, uh, uh, is this like you just need to be in the room or is it, it needs to be something attached, attached to the door to listen, uh, to directly or. I well, Brian, we as I stall for time, as I try to read this article more thoroughly to give you an intelligent answer. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I, I shouldn't have asked, uh, what, I, what I should, I should have used my I statements and said, uh, I wonder if it just can hear it in the room or if it needs to be attached to uh so it looks like it needs audio of, of some yeah. sort and i think that they uh they describe it. it looks like just looking through this uh video from hot mobile 2020 austin texas uh that they do some sort of averaging um also to to like it seems pretty involved you would i uh, but I guess once you have the audio, you have so, the audio. Yeah, but, but you would but you would need clean audio. I guess that that's what Brian's looking for is like, can you just like yeah. hide a, a, a recorder in the plant and listen to it? Or does it need to be like a bug on the uh, door itself, if not on the lock itself, to make sure that you're getting the cleanest possible audio? I mean, if it's the latter now, then it certainly eventually can be the former because, you know, noise reduction and noise cleaning up and... The and they say you can use a smartphone to record the sound. Whoa! Yeah, here we go. Acquiring the audio. Uh, uh, in a walk-by attack, a spy simply walks behind someone just as they unlock a door or locker, holding their phone out to furtively record the sound of the key going to the lock. So far, we have only done this with a phone an unrealistic 10 centimeters from the lock. We are still working on making this attack realizable. The, sec I math the second method is <laughs> hijacking the victim's smartphone so that it records and then transmits the audio over the internet. Oh, sure, because if, if somebody's, you know, just walking with their phone in their left hand and their key in their right, then why wouldn't they? And, and, and they're inadvertently, I mean... Um, the third method might be to use an Internet of Things device that contains a microphone, like a video doorbell, which would be very close to the lock. Oh, Wow. Yeah, it's an example of where if you have enough examples of audio, even imperfect audio, and you know what the key is like, you could basically use machine learning to build something that could take kind of crappy and have a high probability and of getting it right. By the way, uh, Stoic Squirrel quotes a, a, a fair, in the chat, f uh, quotes of a fairly common counter argument of like, why don't you just pick the lock, which uh, my response is always, well, why don't you just kick in the door? I mean, like, yeah. if the idea is you need to appear to be the custodian and and get through as if it's no big deal then you need to have that key already printed and you need to get that key somehow beforehand so uh yeah why not just knock on the door and get them to let you in guys <laughs> yeah right yeah. why not ask politely <laughs> why yeah. not ring the doorbell and say hello
yeah, and it's it's and I, I think that uh I you know, Brian, you you're you're quite knowledgeable of picking locks. I know a little about picking locks and it's not always as easy as just chicka 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 chicka. Well, I, it, cer- certainly, if if you have a highly trained individual, but there's little things like let's say you had a mission critical thing where you couldn't even allow somebody to adopt the posture. Like for example, in order yeah. to pick a lock, you have to bend over and you have to insert two devices, one a tension wrench and then yeah. the other a pick, and you have to work your way through it. And even if you do that very very fast, out of the corner of somebody's eye you know what somebody picking a lock looks like versus you know what a custodian for the millionth time opening the door to get the the IT whatever is looks like. My favorite like XKCD cartoon about security, and I'm going to get it wrong, is like, yeah, like the nerdy guy is like, ah, I'm using like 64-bit layer crypto to protect all my documents on the laptop. And he's like imagining like the bad guys are there like, ah, he's we can't get through it, 64-bit crypto, whatever. In reality, they're like, Hey, hit the guy with the hammer until he gives us the password. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the wrench. Yeah, Sorry, you know, hit it with the wrench. I, I mean, I think that that this kind of stuff is more fascinating in the idea of well, how long will we believe locks are a thing that we should feel safe with? Like, is is this more? Does this push us more to different solutions? I, well, you, to me, locks are a legal construct. Um, uh, if a door is unlocked and somebody walks into headquarters and walks off with our computers, then he could say, once he's arrested and found, because he will be arrested and found, he could say, uh, I didn't know I couldn't do that. And... I would have not much of a case. I, I would have a lesser case against him than if I bothered to put up locks because then now, uh, even if he picks the lock, well, it's just that, like that shows uh, an intent to penetrate someplace that he does not have permission to be in because uh, a key is implied permission. So really all, all these things are, are symbols that help to clarify things in, in a court of law. Yeah, I agree. Because like when you go to sleep at night in your house, we often don't just lock the door. We deadbolt it. We use a thing that on the other side of it, like, you know, you can't just unlock it. You have to yeah. you know, do something in there. So right. I think that kind of shows the difference between property and personal life. Well, and plus also remember, uh, you can kick in a door or when, I mean, the uh, getting one of those breaching bars, uh, this, you know, what, 50 bucks on, on eBay, you walk up, you, you could get in. I mean, it, it makes you no more safe. It's just an insurance policy or, or it's just a, a, I don't know. Right? Like I say, I think it's a, it's a, about effort. Illegal. You're saying it's about effort. No one, no one is safe. We can all be, uh, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the masses can descend upon all of us at any time well, and rip apart our precious lives. Well, and with so I think much it's hate. the important reminder. The real reminder here is, guys is never make brian brush with your enemy <laughs> yes Wait, yes there, there's also a second amendment and also use his affiliate code for breaching bars <laughs> on Amazon. <laughs> uh, th- there's also a second amendment aspect to it because if somebody um just opens an unlocked door and walks in and you shoot them and they die then you saying uh, he was in my house. Then the the lawyer for the other family says, um, "Yeah, no, he he was confused. He thought he was going into his place." And and yeah. but but if the door is locked, even you know, and there are locks that um, just happen to. Uh, uh, have you ever experienced that where a key that didn't go to a lock happened to work on it? I've never had that. Oh, I, 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 I full on opened up somebody else's Jeep uh, Cherokee, uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee uh, with my lock because the, the keys just universally were similar enough uh, oh, that, that, that it slid in and opened. And I got in and I, and I, was, I, I had the key in the ignition to drive away in what I thought was my car. And I looked down and I realized I was sitting on not the cheap seats, but, but uh, older plush uh, or, or uh, older uh, uh, brown leather seats and i realized that i had full-on walked up my key was close enough to get the door open because the gears the whatever were worn down enough 
Like if they, so let's expand that metaphor and decide that maybe that could be the type of thing in the house. It was a case of where it, uh, my car was like two down from it and I was coming home from sixth street. So uh, uh, just out of the corner of the, the, the eye, it, everything seemed close enough. So now you're doing that, which is why as, as Andrew was saying, we deadbolt before we go to bed. Because now if somebody's inside your house and you know you've deadbolted it and you shoot them dead, that's a much different story than even locking it. And certainly a much, much different story than leaving the door unlocked. You see the story in the chat room? Uh, no, I missed pretty it. pretty funny. What is it? Yeah, JV Phobic says, I worked at a semi-dealership. We found out after a month or so that our loaner was the same key as an employee's. His car was used multiple times without him knowing it during the day. Oh, wow. <laughs> when, when did I go to Wendy's? Huh. Gosh. That's crazy. No, I... I, I, I yeah. I didn't even know that was a, that was possible. Like I didn't know that was a that was a thing. That's crazy. Oh, nobody's safe. I sent Bryce uh, a video or link to one of my favorite. I've mentioned this before. Two minute papers is just a wonderful YouTube series about AI developments in it. You know, a couple times a week he puts up new new videos about different stuff. And this is really kind of crazy because what it is, it's being able to take very like abstract images and like render video footage from it. So uh, if you play so this, like we're looking we'll, at a clip here, yeah, go, Bryce. We're, we're looking at a clip here of uh, it looks like a dash cam of uh, of, a, of a car driving down the street. Oh Brian. my gosh! Uh, yeah, and and uh, so if 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 I'm guessing where this is headed, first of all, it looks like. Just straight up dash cam footage. I would have believed it out of the corner of my eye outside of like those trees are, are very uh, blendy uh, and there's a little bit of mushiness. But but now I it shows it next to just like a purple blob and a blue blob and some green blobs. And then it just changes all of that into uh, virtually. Uh, I mean, I mean, I, 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 I'm not going to call it real realistic or movie quality or whatever, but, uh, but wow, it, it, it makes it into a real video. It looks like a dash cam. Yeah. He referenced the, there was like, remember they did, they made an AI was able to make Pac-Man by watching Pac-Man. It was able to figure out the rules of Pac-Man by watching enough. And you can take the same thing. What they did is they took the just color blob. Like this is a car, just a, you know, outline of a car. This is street. This is like four colors to sort of just define stuff took that and used a system that trained on a ton of data on what cars were and streets were, and then it was able to procedurally generate this. And what this new paper does is cool is it has memory, because that's one of the problems with some of these things is it won't remember 800 frames later what was at the original point, because it doesn't really know that it came back to this. This new paper shows the ability to remember where it came from, and they just showed this clip of where, you know, when people do the video where everybody freezes and the camera moves around. Yeah, yeah. And, in early examples, like the camera would come back on a person, their shirt would change. In this new one, the shirt is the same because the AI goes, oh, we're back to where we started. It has a, um, wow. uh, what what neurologists, uh, what, a, a persistence of vision, persistence of, of memory. Memory, like a, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and a sense of spatial memory too. It understands that, that it's not just this ball, this is like, oh, mm -hmm. this is based on this other thing here. So... Very cool, very creepy, very fascinating. But you're we're getting to the point where you could take a book, tell it what your take, tell an AI what your characters look like, and say, "Oh yeah," and you know, use David Fincher style, and it would be able to start generating. At first, it's gonna look, we'll be like, "Oh, and well." First, we'll be like, "Oh, this looks like garbage," but then it will not. Yeah. Well, and, and keep in mind, once it's made that movie and, and gotten, you know, little nudges here or there, and it's like, oh, fix this, tweak that, too much, too little, do this, do that. Um, if, if there's a unified database that knows all of those things, now it's, <laughs> now it's just going to be even better the next time it does it. Well, I, and, you know, procedurally generated content, we've talked about this a lot, and uh, a full disclosure, I'm working with OpenAI on some projects, not relating to this, but in general on their API. Um, you're seeing that and other text generators, like we've we played with before, like having to generate like fake podcast episodes and stuff. We're not that too many generations removed from 
we just feed in the stories that I fed it and it consuming, God, how many hours we've had of this show. And it could do a version of our show that would be indistinguishable from what we do. Probably better. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, I'm thinking of all the artifacts that it would make sure to put in there, like me stammering and uh, and, and, yeah. and and cutting you off and ruining bits <laughs> beforehand while, and Andrew's uh, kind but exasperated sigh as he, he says, well, way to cut to the end, Brian. <laughs> no, I, I like it. I know I love this. I love it when it's I love it's when it's the I love it when it, it's the. You, I love watching you put two and two together. That is really that is the fun part for me. Is I mean, it does you have help. It read. It it does help that 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 you're setting up the bit and you're taking me ninety nine percent of the way well, there. <laughs> well, but I but I mean, aside of it's like like I think that from our what we started with, what we consume outside, we've done so many stories and so many weird things about different stuff. Like my favorite example was the cave. And the footprints were on the ceiling. And Brian's like, oh, maybe it was mud that receded away. <laughs> Damn yeah. it, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> there's, some, there's some guy somewhere Headshot. who spent three years staring at this footprint on <laughs> the ceiling, you know. Uh, man. Uh, uh, so so uh, let, let me ask you guys on an emotional level, how cool are you with all of this? Uh, with uh, all of this eventually becoming as perfect as as a Michael Crichton novel would have predicted uh, 30 years ago or whatever. I mean, I mean we know, yeah, we, we know, we know which side uh, Andrew's picked. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just so like, yeah, I've been working with open AI and the reason I've been doing that is that I want to help get tools out there for creatives and other people so everybody can benefit and use this technology. That is my goal. My, I think this stuff is powerful, it's amazing. When I got to work with the API that, they, that we talked a bit about, I had an amazing experience. I was able to see, do really cool things, could see the limitations, but could see the directions going. And, and a little light bulb clicked on my head is, I want to help other people outside of machine learning and AI learn how to use this stuff. I want to help make tools to make it easier for other people to use this. And so, that's why you know when OpenAI said, "Do you want to work with us on some stuff?" I'm like, "I'd love to," because this is this is my goal. Is this stuff is powerful? Whether it comes from whoever it comes from, it's going to be transformative and better that we're thinking now how to make it accessible than later on. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that specifically through where we are right now with AI, uh, the the immediate future is more uh, how it's going to be used as a tool for creatives I, I think the idea of enter a thing it spits out a perfect version of like you know a movie you put in a book and it spits out a perfect movie version is a little bit in in the offing and what's going to get us there is more the idea of people taking ai and using it to build better art you know human curated use of ai to go forward and uh, I, I think that's something that will be very exciting. It will, it will be a gigantic leap forward in the way that you know being able to use a digital calculator was. You know, well, and and, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I just, I just to get, I, I want to hear your point, but I will give you an example. Using what Justin's doing with Raise the Dead, I see because the first thing these the AI is going to be is like it's going to be good tools to help you do the thing you want to do better because it's still at this point it still can't do some of the really hard creative stuff. I could see where Justin can say, okay, here's my script for Raise the Dead. Send it to an AI that says, okay, this is a cool point. You can improve this, work on this because this is your style you like. Goes to there, records his podcast, and then an AI that works on voice stuff, whatever, said, hey, I clicked, I corrected the couple times where you, you stuttered or whatever, and I smoothed that over. Then say, okay, I want to make the YouTube, I want to make the video of it. And it says, great, I've pulled up a bunch of footage, a bunch of footage and stuff, and what I can't get the rights to I've generated footage at the 1960 convention. Yeah. You know, I've generated this stuff. And then Justin can say, great, I can now produce the audio and a video documentary on this using these tools. So all of a sudden, his thinking is amplified tremendously. So picture yeah. this. Uh, picture getting to a point where educators uh, are able to use these tools and say, uh, uh, I need you to explain how mitochondria works using metaphors in the style of a Marvel superhero action movie 
it needs to be, and then a slider bar. Uh, is this a five minute YouTube vignette where you have to overly simplify things? Or is this a 30 minute in depth thing where you add, you start adding characters to represent different chemical reactions? Or is this a, 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 a Ken Burns style 10 hour documentary in which we start with where it came from, how it evolved, what it's good for, why it was kept around, what the precedents were, what the effects are, what might be possible. And now, and, and, and all of that, um, if like we're talking about the ability to matrix style by translating into high fidelity stories information where you just download modules. We already have a proto version of that with YouTube where it's like, if you want to know how to change a carburetor, you load up the five minute YouTube and there's, there's a five minute version made by a human, a 30 minute version made by a human that explains a little bit more about it or a, a series about carburetors. Um, just all of that done by computers so that you can, uh, you could keep the young minds engaged. Oh, and that's the other thing you could do have a slider bar on uh, this is great. Unfortunately, uh, this is a, a, this is great for a seven year old. Uh, I need you to punch it up and make it more interesting for a 17 year old. So you slide it over to 17 year old. So there's like a sex subplot and, and there's three F bombs and then, uh, but, but it's still explaining how mitochondria works at the end of the day. So I, I just, I didn't fine tune. I didn't do any sort of tuning on that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let me give you an example. I did, I did one, because I think you can adjust temperature and all that, whatever, to make things different work. So one of the things I did is I said, uh, look, my 10 year old asked me to explain how mitochondria works using Marvel Comics references. The mitochondria is like the Hulk. It's a big green, big green guy, like smash thing. It's a powerhouse. It's the powerhouse of the cell. It's a, you know, oh, so is, and then is, I, is this is this open AI right now? That's this is the uh, the playground. Yeah. Oh, that's so amazing. Like and so like really, it's just a matter of engineering fidelity uh, to actually show it and tell it. And in the voice of Stan Lee and with the yeah. licensed likeness of, of the Marvel characters. Yeah, it's the ability, the ability that it has to understand sort of metaphors and to like speak in that way is really incredible and i've seen examples of like as you know, incredible as never mind you the word incredible i guess i can't think of any references <laughs> <that. laughs> <Don't> screw you <laughs> yeah uh, so anyhow yeah it's very good at using analogies like that and as is right now but like you said that's a first step towards something else and i think that's really really the thing i want people to focus on is the idea of and think about how how would you use this to help do what you're doing? What kind of work do you not want to do that you wanted to do? And, and some people are trying to use it for just pure, I wanted to tell me stories and it can, it'll get there. But right now it's like, I wanted to help me tell better stories. I want to help yeah, me tell I mean, stories in different mediums. That's, that's the biggest thing, especially with something like, like raise the dead. When you're looking at the project, you really don't know. We, all of our histories have been curated as kind of final drafts, right? And even stuff from the era, stuff afterward. Uh, uh, it is a modern idea and one, I think, really shaped by the internet that we are looking for the whole story and not the real story or the story that you need to know. And that is like just a fundamental uh, a refocusing of... Uh, how we think of stuff. And so it makes it very hard when you're going back and, and researching that uh, there's no master list of just, hey, what's everything that happened? What's every book that's ever been written on this? What's every piece of firsthand data? And that stuff that's here, like based on what OpenAI is doing and what I've, I've, I've seen firsthand, we're like, the, the engine is there. It, it needs to be fine tuned to do what I want it to do. But uh, uh, that's, that's here now. And that's like a researchers that used to be a team of three for a year, you know, like, and now it can be done in, in 15 seconds. Well, and so think about this. Uh, now all of a sudden I'm thinking of it as a time travel machine that reveals a, a hidden history that uh, we didn't know was there because many parts of history we know because there was one 
defining, well-written or particularly well-distributed piece of, of, you know, of storytelling that was associated with that moment. But meanwhile, there are uh, thousands of fragments and, and, and pieces that, um, that were not widely distributed or, but were maybe closer to the source or whatever. So, uh, of course, you know, NPR is full of the hidden history behind stories. And what, as you mentioned, Justin, people have to do is go and find those scraps that weren't popular enough to survive and, and become well-known today. Uh, a computer has all the time in the world, and the more of history that we feed it, the more an AI would be able to say, uh, hey, tell us what happened at this event. And it takes, it takes the very popular, very well-known account and holds it up right next to and along with all the fragments that were are very tedious, incomplete, uh, non-poetic, uh, and then and then and in running its AI game says, uh, yeah, no, this dude threw the first punch, and it was definitely this other guy that uh, is guilty of the thing, uh, or or most likely to be guilty of the thing, and that and you know no nobody with a symmetric symmetrical chiseled face. Uh, uh, who happened to be one race or another uh, affected the decision. It's, 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 it's statistically most likely that this is, and then it can make a movie of that moment uh, as it more likely occurred than we know it as. You can, yeah, it's exciting to think about what happens when you're able to take a lot of data and connect it to other things, you know, like, we know a lot about like Roman life because the Romans documented stuff and we could still find the remnants of their forts and things like this. But when you start extending outward, we talked about this on a previous episode of like, you know, in the Americas, particularly in South America, where a lot of stuff was built in jungles, environments where things, anything not made out of stone didn't last. And it's one of the problems of archaeology is often that stone stuff, we go, ah, look, they built with stone. But we don't pay a lot of attention to what people built with wood in a lot of cases because the wood didn't last. And yeah. but you could start to sort of extrapolate from like, oh, we know we know this, a group like this would probably need this many calories per day. So they needed to be getting their calories from somewhere, which means that maybe there was either gonna be crops or something or whatever. And you could start extrapolating from that and using other examples and like filling in the blank spots of what we know about other things. But then you could get analogy where you could be like, yeah, no, we think there had to be, you know, we think there had to be like a lake that fed, you know, a farmland somewhere here in Peru. And now let's go dig in this likely spot where it could be like, oh, lo and behold, our model said there should be something here, and now we found it. And uh, <laughs> it's tempting at this point to say, well, I mean, models are just models. And it's like, hey, dude, uh, models got us to the moon. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, and models and, and, can be pretty reliable. <laughs> and that's the thing is, with that example is the idea is using it to give you an example of where to dig. You know, to say, how do we verify this? How do we prove this? And I think there's going to be cases where we're going to say, like, oh, no, according to this, there should be something here. You know, one of the things that's been neat is a lot of uh, NASA's related, at least some of the footage and, you know, some of the, the films from our uh, photographs from, like, Project, the Corona Project, which was our first, like, spy satellite project, right? Because things change over time. And then we've had some stuff from, like, World War II. We were able to look at, like, Alexandria and other cities and stuff, you know, before the big buildup of aerial photography of places like this. And then we're seeing stuff of like parts of the, like the, the Silk Road caravan routes. In some places it goes away, but you're like, well, we know it was here and we know it was here. There's something between the two spots. There might also have been some small cities there too. So now we have an idea where to look. Man, and then you start getting into, even if there's no remnants left of, let's say the Silk Road or whatever, you have a beginning point and end point, and then you can feed it all the topology in between and and uh, all of a sudden it's like well if you you know had thousands of generations to figure out how to get from point a to point b this is definitely the shortest easiest route uh, and it would make a lot of sense uh for for this to have been it and then now you know where to look and go poking around for more data uh, confirming data yeah and things like the spread of genes you know and also some of the, like we still historically like bubonic plague and things like this we have an idea of where these things may have came from but we're not quite sure but then all of a sudden once you establish trade routes and stuff you start yeah you holistically you can put together a much bigger picture of the past well and, 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 and now i'm back to the fragments or whatever because uh, a phrase that is on a slip of paper in one area that 
you think is totally unrelated to the bubonic plague, suddenly, if you know the, tr if you figure out the trade routes, the the likely routes, and you f uh, figure out the type of people who would trade and the timing and the and all that stuff, then all of a sudden, the most casual, tiny slip of paper becomes more confirming evidence of like, uh, uh, you know, uh, per the way language worked at the time, this phrase would be the way somebody would express, I saw a dark boil on somebody's face. He was gross and made a pass at me. Uh, and even, and here's the reason that, that, you know, even though this town was never affected by bubonic plague, it, it, wow, it, it really does. The, 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 well, the, the more you can hold in, in your, your bucket, um, I, it just, it's, it's a giant, um, uh, snowball effect. One of the ways we try to date stuff, too, is we'll look at when this culture recorded certain astronomical events, then we might go look at the Chinese history of that, because, like, you know, Chinese astronomers were recording comets and things for a long time. And you find, like, oh, you know, the Vikings talked about this event with such and such, but we know in the year 426 in, you know, China, they recorded the same sort of event. That means this probably, you know, came from the same time period, so. Man, the cool. idea of everything going in one big bucket and stuff becoming more obvious is i mean it's it's terrifying and exciting and crazy and and there are there are deep um i don't know both political and humanistic ramifications to to it in terms of uh yeah. who, who owns that that information and that data and and that synthesis that ability to combine two facts you know completely yeah. unrelated guys go watch devs uh yeah no i i mean i i didn't want to bring it up again but but that's really what we're teasing around is Yo. dev devs is some real it's happening it's really happening price price hates devs. <laughs> no he doesn't no he doesn't he thinks it's fine price it's, hates it's devs. fine oh, he hates it it's though fine. it's man <laughs> i don't want to welcome that kind of hate in my heart the way price hates devs <laughs> let's do some picks here uh, mm. You know what? I'll double down on my pick from earlier, the Rebel DV guide, uh, the DV Rebels Guide. Uh, it's a foundational book um, that, that that is very very easy to read. I don't know how dated it is uh, in terms of the equipment, but the fundamentals of just understanding. If you want to learn in a world where we're all shooting from home, you should learn how to light a shot, compose a shot. You should learn how to pace things. You should learn um, uh, just 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 how to run and gun. It's it's very simple stuff. It's very easy. There's lots of pictures, and it's like you'll you'll read it and you'll say, "Oh, I get it now. I can make good video." <laughs> so uh, it's by uh, Stu Mashwitz, and he's also done some cool stuff. He wrote some software called a uh, Slugline, which is a really cool uh, software for like if you want to like write scripts and stuff. It's very intuitive. Um, and I think I know him because I think the first time I ever encountered Stu, who wrote that, was he was inquiring about the rights to my book, Public and Mini Zero, years ago. No kidding. That's wonderful. Wow. How cool. Yeah. But yeah, Slugline, I don't think they have a new version or they do it, but that's really cool. So like he's, he's, uh, he's created, he's a guy that's kept active in creating cool tools and other stuff too. I watched episode one of a documentary last night called <laughs> The Vow. It is about uh, Nixium, the uh, uh, I guess company that was eventually revealed to be a little bit more of a cult, and the leaders for which, including a uh, a few very famous actresses or television actresses, were kind of uh, uh, revealed to uh, be running a sex trafficking <laughs> ring, effectively. Uh, it was it was good. I like the documentary. They are slow playing it. it we're kind of getting into this era of these documentary series where, you know, look, I don't know how many episodes this this uh, thing's going to be, but boy, do they get deliberate about how long they want to stretch stuff out. But I do feel that the first episode was very affecting for me because. <sighs> Having read about Scientology and certain other cults and stuff like that, I, I, I've always understood how people could fall in, but I've never really been able to connect specific elements of, uh, of you know, those organizations to people that I have known. But 
you know, we've all spent time in the organized skepticism field, and we all know that there is, uh, of course, a, a great benefit to understanding and uh, uh, being more into a critical thinking perspective. We also know that that is not the cure to all of life's ills, and sometimes people become more frustrated when they are living in a rational uh, a space, a critical thinking space. And boy, howdy, could I see people from that. They don't spell it out in this episode that, that there was an element of the uh, either skeptic or atheist crowd that was more specifically primed to fall in to the, the Nixium crowd. But man, did I recognize personalities that I have seen uh, uh, in, in some of the areas that, that uh, we have all kind of frequented through and boy, did it really run a, a chill down my spine. Uh, it, it sounds like you're, uh, I don't want to say tap dancing, but delicately expressing the sentiment that um, uh, uh, there's a, t uh, much like in the seventies, uh, uh, scientists uh, perceived that they couldn't possibly fall for, a simple magic trick uh there, there, there's an essence of it they some uh, some some skeptical folks would perceive that they couldn't possibly fall into a cult and and it's it's designed very deliberately where this is not magic and this is not everything is it's it's because it's just this new science that this brilliant man has created and and boy are there charts and are there like all these different ways that you cannot feel like you're an idiot for spending x amount of money to go to this uh, uh self-help thing it's a lot of the same tenets of science Scientology, you know, in terms of the uh, psychology of it, of, of breaking down barriers in front of other people, and therefore you feel very connected to everybody. But like, this is not, uh, uh, this is not because they have a magic machine. It's because there is just a a way that this very very smart man Vanguard has. Uh, uh, you know, uh, figured out the way that the human brain works and has indeed cracked. And this is what the first episode goes into the science of joy. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things that frustrated me a lot when I worked in a skeptical community was that, and this was sort of a, a bias of skeptics would be, they would go like, why do people hate science? They'd be like, we got to come by people. We, we, we have to fight all this anti-science, you know, mentality. People hate science. And I'm like, and I'm the one person in the room going, again, it's my memory, maybe wrong, but I'm like, people don't hate science. People love science. Even the most pseudoscientific thing that you hate, astrologers or whatever, will claim that it's scientific. People love yeah. science. They love the idea of science. That's why they try to drape science around it. They're not, they're like, oh, these stupid scientists, let's burn. They're no, they just don't understand what is and what is it. And that was a frustrating thing for me because I kept, it was this weird tribalism, like, oh, well, they hate science. I'm like, no, they like it. They just you're you're conflating somebody disagreeing with you with disagreeing with science. And that's a very different thing. And if you frame your argument like, well, how do we get them to like science? Problem solved. They all do. They just don't know what is and what isn't. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I'm, I'm excited to get further into uh, the documentary. It's uh, uh, I know from what I know of the story, we did not even scratch the surface of some of the stuff that, that went on. So uh, uh, The Vow on HBO. I involuntarily gasped when you said watch the first episode of a documentary series because last night Netflix did one of those shove it in your face uh, trailers and I clicked on it and it's for the documentary series High Score. Um, I, I really enjoyed the first episode. I watched yeah. two episodes of that. Yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was good. Hmm. Yeah, Thanks. very good production values on that. Uh, I got a pick. This is something that I uh, picked about three weeks ago. And then a few days after we did that recording, that pick became <laughs> invalid because it shut down uh, very briefly. But it's back, baby. Play ball. Blaze ball is back, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> why, why, why did it shut down? <laughs> they, they took it down for two weeks because... Um, there was a lawsuit from the Los Angeles... Yeah, uh, uh, baseball uh, league. Yeah, yeah, no, the, the Los Angeles uh, uh, cup fillers or well, waitresses. Well, it was the it was the L.A. tacos, but now they're the unlimited tacos because so, okay, so baseball. If 
you didn't hear it. Uh, it's a online uh, baseball league. You can bet. It's free. You can bet coins, and uh, you uh, they they simulate games every hour. So every team plays um, a game every hour. So like we've got the results from uh, the game that just wrapped up uh, for this two p.m. Uh, uh, score here. And so you pick a team that's your like favored team, um, and then Monday through Friday they play a game pretty much 24, 24 hours uh, until they hit 100 games. And then on Saturday is the postseason. And what is really interesting about baseball is that it's two things, right? It's like, here's like a faux sports. It's a sports betting game, but it's free. You, If you run out of coins, they'll give you coins. You, there's no paid transaction going on. Um, and then there's like a collaborative lore element. So if you get into the Discord or if you go on Twitter and you see all the fan art and you see all of the backstories that everyone is making for the characters. And there, there's a, a team, the Seattle Garages, who have put together... <laughs> multiple EPs of fan written music ah! about the game, about the players, all sorts of really good stuff. Everyone comes up with chants for their team. And so you go into the discord and, and when a game really pops off, when it goes into to overtime, into extra innings, um, you just have that endorphin rush. It's just like, it's, 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 uh, uh it's, 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 it's a rush is, is a big way to describe it because every hour n- new set of games, you know check check the stats check the lineups and then bet and then it's 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 a really dangerous cycle I, I, well i would imagine it's the kind of thing <laughs> that you start off like faux cheering live and then at some point you realize oh no i'm unironically cheering yeah <laughs> and so is everybody else <laughs> yeah uh i think uh uh, on that last season that they did before they shut down for a few weeks, I think I even booted up our Twitch channel here and like was calling one of the ah, games during the finals. You calling one of the games? I was calling yeah. the games, yeah. Uh, which was fun. I'd like to do that more now that you it's know, back. It, it's it's really really funny because there are some sports now that I love, and at one point in my life I watched very closely that I almost totally <laughs> interact with now via Reddit and podcasts. I don't watch them all that much. Like I, I catch them when I can. But the life, my fandom is in these ancillary worlds. And I think that's a super cool idea to say, what if the sport really didn't exist and you were just random number generating Mm -hmm. and you were even doing it on a way where things were more compressed. So the, all the ancillary stuff was just the point. That is the point of it was the reaction. It's number one. You're right, Andrew. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And so uh, we're in season four. This is the season of, of feedback uh so last uh last season before they shut down uh the community voted uh, there's also a voting element so you could vote to uh, benefit your team or to unlock things for the community one of the things that was unlocked was interviews and so now when you go to uh you used to only be able to see the lineups and, and the star ratings but now you can click into people and see like more specific stats uh you can see uh, what their pregame ritual is. So York Silk here on the Fridays, he likes to LARP before the game. Uh, what style of coffee they like. Uh, their blood type. Um, their soul screen. Blood type is grass. <laughs> I love. <laughs> oh, I love. I love um, that they lean into the ridiculous on this. Yeah, you know, like they they have a rule book and it's all like blanked out, like an SCP sort of thing. So it's 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 a lot of fun, and I think. Uh, it's also something where by virtue of being free and by the community being very family friendly, like even the discord server that they're in, there's like no cussing allowed. It, they have a bot that will detect it and kick you the heck out. Um, and so it's, it's very approachable. And I think it, I was upset that they took those two weeks off right at kind of the, a height, you know, their, their peak of, of interest, all these news articles about it and uh, all, all sorts of Twitter people getting interested in it. But, you know, using it a little bit now that now that the season it was started. a server thing, though, right? They, they needed to they needed to tune the server because wasn't it going down? Yeah, it was it, it was a, it was a combination of things. There was hacking going on. The servers were getting overloaded quite a bit. There were a lot of quality of life things that they could not um that they needed time to to figure out like they've revamped uh like the the, even little things like the betting window now like is 
this used to be like a drop down box and it used to be really confusing who you were betting for and li- little things that when you're also maintaining a six day a week live game become yeah. very difficult. So, so I, I actually think like that they actually had really good dividends. So blazeball.com. Uh, I think it's really cool. Andrew, you got a pick? Yeah, I do have a pick. I saw a thing. This was announced months ago and then it just popped up on YouTube and I watched it. It was an hour and a half long and I loved it. I had no idea how much I would love it. And this is, uh, get the name right. Live from the space stage, a Halix story. And I think we may have talked about this before. Halix was a band that Disneyland, Disney music created back in 1981. It was supposed to be kind of the sign. The idea was sort of a Star Wars meets Kiss because Disney music label, which had done like, the, you know, the disco Mickey stuff, wanted to try to create a more, you know, wider appeal band. And so they created this rock band and basically tried them out at the Tomorrowland, at the stage, at the Tomorrowland stage below Space Mountain one summer in 1981. And by the end of the summer, the goal is to showcase them, get them practice, whatever. And things like they had like a Chewbacca like dude playing bass guitar. Okay. They had like this robot synthesizer dude who looked like a stormtrooper, you know, in this built in synthesizer. They had an amphibian dude playing percussion and they had a, a great lead singer. And uh, so they, they were there for one summer and then they got a deal with Warner Brother Music, but then that folded. And then it sort of, you know, there's more to the story what happened. But uh, uh, it is a really good documentary, really well done. And it is, uh, it's from the it was produced by defunct land which does the wonderful sort of stuff on disney and there were people who had fond memories of 1981 of going to see halix because the thing was the band was good the band was yeah. actually good and that was sort of the surprise it was it's 1981 you know pop rock kind of music but it was a actually way better should have they had one of the people helping do music was mike post the guy who did theme songs for like doogie hauser law and order and a ton of stuff so the skill and the talent, it was Disney doing a great job of making a thing, but then what happened to it? And that this documentary gets into what happened. The really emotional, touching. Uh, I think it's Michael Serrano, the guy who did this. First time ever doing a documentary. First time directing anything and knocked it out of the park. It is good or better than many of the things you'll see on Netflix or Disney Plus or whatever. It's free. It's free. You can watch this thing for free. Is, look is, up. Is it know. on the Defunct Land channel or where? Yep. Yep. Oh. Yep. It's on the Defunct Land channel. Oh, that's so great. I'm so excited. I, it, this is def, an instant must watch. Yeah. I, I was, I was curious because at first I'm like, I never heard of Halix, although I was in California at that time and I will convince myself at some point that I saw them live. <laughs> um, nah. But uh, it was, you're like, oh, what a goofy thing to do. And then you hear some of the music, like, oh, this is actually pretty good. And you see the stage show, you're like, and I want to do this. And they talked about how they had teenagers that kept coming back night after night to see them, you know, and kept doing it because, like, the lead singer was phenomenal. And there was just a great, talented band. And I hope to God Disney brings this back. Like, like yeah. Disney, you've got, you know, you've got a gold mine here. You've got this. I've actually asked a friend at Disney who knows some of the people in music, like, could you check in to see if these, if these albums are actually lost? You know, could you, could you maybe see? And, and there, I, I could vouch for people coming back na- night after night, like during Halloween Horror Nights, uh, people would, you know, you buy a season pass, you go every single oh, night yeah. and it's like, uh, uh, you know it's a uh i i would feel guilty because i would see the same faces show after show and uh, a friend of mine reminded me like hey man every time i play star wars i don't expect it to be different i put it in for a reason you know yeah yep yep so it's like yeah and that's you know for many many teen, you know many young teens or tweens this is their first exposure to any kind of rock concert kind of thing or anything like that and i i yeah it is it is i I don't, I'm curious to see your reactions on this because I hope we can talk about it next week to see. But I, I love the way this was done. I mean, overall, the effect of what they did. And I thought for somebody who, as far as I know, had never directed a documentary to come in and make this thing and just in Defunct Land, hats off to Kevin Perger and Defunct Land, which is one of the best YouTube channels, bar none, just yep. the quality of the Full content. Stop. Yeah, we're in, a, we're in a golden age where like, I like the Netflix series when I've seen High Score. I think that's really well done. But what I'm watching people do with just a small team of people doing music and other stuff, what I'm watching two or three person teams do on YouTube, 
is phenomenal. And it, and I remember having, you know, Justin and I worked, you know, we did documentaries for G4 and we kind of kind of could understand it where the enemy wasn't our creativity or lack thereof. The enemy was the environment in which you're trying to create stuff in there. You know, had we got to yeah. do the show we wanted to do, you would have had a in-depth documentary on Elon Musk in 2008. You know, you would have had a thing that really went into like, you know, uh, esports and stuff, the darker side. You know, we could have done so much more stuff, but yep, no. And uh, so and, and, it's amazing. And again, just major hats off to every everyone on the Defunct Land team. That's I'm so excited. Yeah. I'm so stoked. Yep. So, good job, gentlemen. It's been weird. <laughs> What's funny is I was, I was like, no, it's after. Oh, no, wait. Yeah, this is the weird thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here, I'm going to run to the restroom. A, a few moments here and get ready for <laughs> after things. <laughs> hey, Justin. Yo, what up? How's it going? Yo. You have a good weekend? Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Did you get my email? I did. I need to find time to check that thing out. I got a text message from a mutual friend of ours about the their inclusion in the project, and I'm very excited for that. Yes. That's yes. very exciting. Our mutual friend has been busy. Yeah. It's busy, and busy, it sounds busy. like you sounds like you're keeping them busy. Keeping them busy. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's um you know, it's uh, uh, well. I'm sure at a certain point I'll be able to talk about this without we'll dancing. Time. But uh, yeah, you know, uh, 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 that's that was most of the weekend. Mostly, I had a kind of an internal deadline that I had to sort of push this out of the nest, um, mm -hmm. just to kind of get larger feedback from people that aren't me. Uh, which is and then uh, which it seemed like helped last time. Yeah, and and the difference is is that this time, I think it's a lot more finished than than last time was. Like For I sure. think I have I have a DNA. The problem is uh, figuring out. Well, is it a good DNA? <laughs> <laughs> you know, is it is it good? Uh, maybe it's bad. No. Uh, well, or confusing and, and, you know, this is the process, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit, my ego hopefully can be a little bit more callous, uh, having gone through the process at least once and understanding that, you know, what period this is, but, um, yeah, you know, that, and then, you know, the week before was working on this project and then setting up this set for all the convention coverage and, this weekend was just getting this final thing ready to go, which basically meant like rewriting and re-recording the final episode. Mm. Um, and then just all the dumb technical stuff like, but yeah, uh, uh, the, you know, another big, big stream heavy week today oh, yeah. and, and yeah, tomorrow. How, how, uh, uh, so I guess we'll have to see. Like, we won't be able to make a call on on like night attack until we see kind of what it looks like tonight in terms of timing and stuff, right? I mean, I presume that it'll be the exact same thing where uh, I will be kind of bagging on the last half hour of the programming uh, to come do night attack, yeah. which is fine. Um, Are they going to put... I know that they were saying Trump is going to speak every day or four days of it. Is he, are they saving him for the end? He has, that might he be has, al he has already spoken at the <laughs> Republican national convention this morning. So, uh, yeah, we oh, are, wow. um, I didn't realize that. yeah, we are, we are going to get a lot of, uh, a lot of Trump. I don't know where he's going to speak or whether or not he's only going to headline the last night or uh, huh. we just know that he will be a part of it but then again like biden was a part of uh, all four nights for the democrats like he was oh, in yeah, yeah like, like round table bits. packages and yeah so it's like it's not like he was like kept in a box and then like you know <laughs> unfurled for the for the audience at the very end uh 
How did you? But, uh, yeah. How are you liking the virtual convention experience? I know there's probably a good bit lost when you can't actually go to like a real expo and 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 you know interview people face to face. I mean, my only experience with covering a convention was flying to the convention and then sitting on an antiseptic set and talking about what I watched on television. Mm. So like uh, uh, it is sh shockingly similar to what I did last time when I got paid to cover the convention. Like certainly there was a lot more of me being able to walk around and talk to people and just get a sense of what's going on. And you get to, you know, look inside, you know, you get the access of stuff, but um, this is, this is kind of, uh, uh, I don't know. It's it's as fun. It's it's certainly you know the the networking's what you miss. Uh, but but the coverage, like, yeah, I, I don't know. I think the coverage is the coverage is fine. People seem to like it. Uh, I I remember uh, being so excited to go to E three and then realizing that going to E three E three mainly consisted of uh, being about thirty seconds ahead of the rest of the world and not mm -hmm. in front of a keyboard to give your hot takes on Twitter <laughs> and yeah. missing most of the cool stuff. Uh, and so like, uh, I remember the first year I didn't go to E3, I'm like, oh, this is much more fun. <laughs> you just watch yeah. all of the things and give all the hot takes. Yeah, because like the big thing for something like that would be like having access and playing, actually playing hands on, you know, behind closed doors, demos, to taking meetings like that. But even then it's like lines and getting shuffled around and you get like five seconds with something and then, or, or. Well, but, but the behind closed doors would be like scheduled appointment uh, yeah. demos and things, now, but I, not I, everybody gets that. I will say the one real treat to uh, actually going to E3 are those, um, uh, the, the chance to run across, um, that dragon cancer like years before anyone hears about it uh are you familiar with that game mm -hmm. yeah. uh it, like like the, the 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 small guy with a booth and and unfortunately i mean it's it's work like all the best stuff at those conventions are hidden away by bootstrap stuff like that's that's where um as a matter of fact uh, this is how far back on e3 um uh not even in the main campus. You had to take a shuttle and go off to some hotel. Uh, this little bootstrap company uh, had put uh, together a, um, uh, I don't want to say a Doom clone, but they, they avoided calling it a Doom clone or, or a Quake clone or whatever. But uh, they started showing how, uh, unlike you know just humans versus aliens, the military comes in uh, and, and they demonstrate their AI and they're, they're showing all this tech. Uh, these guys, a uh, little company called Valve, and the game was called Half Life. And uh, I, uh, the guy demoing it for me, Gabe Newell. <laughs> like, <laughs> the, like I mean, uh, you have to, uh, that's where, that's the only benefit to being there in person is to go find those those people who are just getting started. And it's speculative bets. I mean, those are those are the people you should be meeting uh, because you could, you know, as they become emerging talent, you can. Uh, uh, suddenly jump in and work with uh, OpenAI hmm. <laughs> before <laughs> anyone has heard of them. Oh, I think you, you've muted yourself, Andrew. Nope. He's just, he, he's he's just <laughs> he's like, no way. He's, he can't. He just wants to do his, <laughs> his mouthing routine. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, OpenAI will simulate what you were saying the entire time. <laughs> oh, you there? Oh, he's recording. Yeah, no, I was looking at something. Sorry. Oh, oh, oh gotcha. Right. <laughs> Man, I, that, my that, dumb joke. That moment, really. the, that, the window closed on that. Uh, that moment that you, like, I'm sitting here pitching this wild-eyed idea of, like, make me a Marvel movie about mitochondria, and then all of a sudden, just boom, the log line shows up. <laughs> like, that was, that was awesome. Yeah, that was a good time. Yeah. Uh... Have you guys seen? I the... had a topic. I'm trying to find it. Oh, let me, let me check my email. What? Sorry. Um, have you guys seen the stuff about uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator? It's back. Oh yeah, I saw the, that one building. Oh yeah, there was one because so it uses Open Maps <laughs> yeah. to uh, to put together some of the data, and there's a 
Where was this in Australia? Uh, no. Yeah, wherever it was, somebody had mistakenly typed in that a building had 206 stories. Instead of two. <laughs> instead of two. And so it's like, okay. And so you're driving and all of a sudden there's like the biggest spire you've ever seen. Melbourne. <laughs> uh, 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 hey, I, I wouldn't mind. Uh, uh, or, or let me tell you what's on my mind if this is of interest to you. I, I would love. To, uh, have we talked about managing schedules lately? And 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 managing how, how to? Yeah. No, but I keep trying to get around to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, that is um, of, of interest yeah, to great. me. Uh, but but uh, okay, but if you, if you have something, then you know we can go. No, I had a really important thing I've been working on last week for Brian. I'll throw it aside for you. It's done. <laughs> Delete it. It's gone. It's gone. <laughs> it might be hydrogen just supplementing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, well do ah, damn it, Brian. You ruined my well, Brian. <laughs> it's like that episode of Star Trek where um, uh, uh, <laughs> they're in the holodeck and uh, uh, <laughs> they're doing a Sherlock Holmes adventure. And it's like they get as far as somebody saying, uh, 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 Sherlock Holmes, it's 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 Jordy LaForge and Data. And he says, uh, uh, somebody has been killed. And then Data just reaches over, grabs the guy, rips his jacket off, and then pulls out <laughs> the evidence and says, I think you'll find that <laughs> and it's over. <laughs> I wonder if I saw, because I had this idea for like a detective that was like, I call it like, uh, you know, Johnny Killjoy. And he would show up <laughs> in the scene, like they'd be like, ah, we found this guy strangled inside of his own freezer, you know, like, ah, and we're, you know, and put up bump music and start like, ah, yeah, his twin brother did it, uh, power cords undone, whatever. Okay, I'm going to go get lunch. <laughs> and they'd be like, He's, he, like he always solves it, like in well, the first you know 20 what it seconds. Could be? It's like, like, it pisses uh, him off. Like the, the series title could be, the Johnny Killjoy mysteries and, and yeah. it, the first three minutes sets up and then he just ruins it. And then the rest of it is like um, Seinfeld style comedy as they're eating lunch or talking about relationships <laughs> yeah. no, and all dude, the other dude, stuff. Come on. Sponsored content. He just always goes to blimpies. Like that's it. Like, <laughs> yeah. it ruins, sets it up, ruins the mystery, goes to blimpies, shop at blimpies. Yeah. Because his, his conceit is he's watched every detective show ever. <laughs> so he knows every single plot of this. You know. And that would he be, loves Blimpies. That would actually be a fantastic yeah. ad pitch. Uh, the, the, mystery, the Johnny Killjoy mysteries. Uh, like, you could get away with five-minute episodes and people would, like, yeah. Okay, so, so what it really is is a, is a comedy series discussion-based, mm -hmm. always at Blimpies. Um, the conceit is the first minute is the killjoy stuff, but but with a straight face they keep acting. <laughs> That's brilliant. If only I owned a Blimpies. <laughs> Man, Blimpies was was the cheapest. Um, uh, I, 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 I apologize for using the word because it was just what I was raised with, but. Blimpies? The, the, no, the, the ghettoist uh, uh, subway. <laughs> like, like anybody could afford a Blimpies franchise. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and it shows. I, I, liked, I liked the Blimpies sub, though. I, I don't know what it was about it, but as a kid, I, I have a fondness for it. Uh, I, I like the idea that I, I did you love get a Blimpies franchise, the guy pulls up in a van, you know, and he's like, ah, here's your shirt. Like, oh, what about the food? Like, oh, come on over to the, go to like the pig wheel. Like, ah, these cold, starts throwing cold cuts into a cart for you yeah, and pretty stuff. Much. And he <laughs> grabs some cardboard, starts drawing a sign, blimpies. Oh, the Quiznos. There you go. Quiznos is the jam. They, they never got their due. Yeah, overrated. Boo. But I like, I like my favorite. My favorite uh, experience at a Quiznos was I go there and I'm waiting to order my food and this woman next to me, and I'm not going to use the term of Karen. Um, she has her food and she sees the sub go into the oven. She goes, Oh, I didn't want it grilled. <laughs> like, it's an effing Quiznos. What do you think they do here? Their slogan <laughs> is, like, It's I, everything is going to be grilled. <laughs> yeah, I was just, I remember watching it go into in this oven, like, I didn't ask for it to be grilled. It's like, You cooked my pizza. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. So. 
ready. Uh, we should Speaking of scheduling. <laughs> and uh, we'll try yeah. to hopefully wrap up around the half hour. Yeah. Awesome. If you don't mind, if we can make this one a little short, because I've, I've, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to catch you in then. Hydrogen. Uh, Andrew, you can come in in three, two. Hello and welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello. Justin Robert Young. Yo. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Yo. So a topic that uh, Brian wants to talk about, which I think is actually very helpful because I'm not good at this, is scheduling. How do you keep everything from happening all at once? Yeah, it, it, uh, there was a time, I was thinking about this the other day, there was a time maybe 10, 15 years ago that um, uh, I knew that a full schedule uh, equaled uh, uh, being able to feed my family. And so I did. N I took no more pleasure than in seeing a full calendar of every single day, I'm going to be at this school, I'm going to do a show in this thing. Uh, uh, this is going to be carved out for practice time. This is going to be family time. Bonnie's got me booked for this or whatever. Um, and then, and then, and then we, I started podcasting and, and then all of a sudden it was like, I retreated and just let the world happen to me. And, uh, that's fine. But when, but, 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 but you get to a point where enough people want enough things from you. Uh, uh, justifiably, I mean, because you've signed up for them, that that you're just constantly running around uh, like a leaf on the wind, like, uh, oh, who's pulling me this way? And 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 it feels like it works because you're making money. You know, like every time somebody grabs you and says, I need you to do blank, you're like, uh, well, I guess it's time to do blank. And, and it makes you money and you feel good about it. But um, uh, we, the first time that Jason came out with the Modern Rogue, um, the goal was let's hit the ground running, which sounded like a good idea to everybody at the time. But then we hit the ground running and it turns out if you run far enough, you die of exhaustion. And uh, it, it, this next round that we're doing right now, it was really interesting because Corey uh, and Jason talked about like, OK, realistically, how many episodes do we want to get? Um, realistically, how much can we rely on Brian to actually be mentally present at point X, Y, or Z? Okay, realistically, you know, let's remember. If at all. Yeah, exactly. Uh, realistically, uh, uh, let's let's remember that uh, that pretty much we're trying to burst on a run of modern rogue episodes while we're in a pod, you know, for COVID related reasons. But uh, uh, it was as though somebody had spoken like an angel when Corey said, I have a suggested schedule. It involves pregnant pause a day off every week. <laughs> and I was just like, why, why? Oh, <laughs> you know, and, it, 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 and of course a day off isn't truly a day off. You, you end up spending it with family obligations or, or something comes up or family, the most dangerous work. Uh, or as they say in uh, what might be my new favorite show, Star Trek Lower Decks, buffer time. It's buff. It's buffer time that that you can overrun into. Uh, but uh, I I I would love to. It's been uh, an extraordinary week or two as we get into a groove, and and there's been some hiccups here or there. But but having that buffer time to the schedule and knowing the winds and the hows of everything. I would love to know how you guys manage your schedule and and what your advice is. Uh, sure. Well, uh, you know, I, I I think I've I've become a lot more schedule conscious over the last year or so, and uh, part of it is being able to start out with um a a skeleton of just like all right uh, i have x amount of times that i'm live that i have to be here for a thing so it's like that's that's the that's the beginning uh what i've found is that you know most of my days are pretty packed these days like especially with me adding the convention coverage and everything there's not a whole lot of unaccounted for time during the day uh and even leading up into when i would like normally go to sleep uh, over the weekend, 
what I will give myself the the gift of is only having to do's. I won't schedule out my weekend. I will I will just give myself a big laundry list of anything else that I didn't get done over the week to do wise. And then the stuff that I like my goals for the weekend. Uh, and so that's what I'm looking at now because I, <laughs> I got uh, caught up and wasn't able to write out my schedule, but that is <laughs> ritualistically what I, what I have been doing is uh, in the morning, wake up, work out, have my breakfast shower. And then the, the next thing I do is physically write out my schedule for the day, just so I know it. Uh, I, I, it forces me to go look into the, the Google calendar to see if I have any interviews that I have forgotten and then write that out just so now I have a framework for, for what I do. Uh, I, 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 Oh, go ahead. No, please answer that. Uh, what, what the, um, um, uh, I think that I had a true phobia and, and I don't mean this like as an over the top bit, I mean, like, I think I was truly phobic. The fastest year of my life was, uh, or two years, was when I was working at Dell and every day was the same. Uh, every day was a lifetime, every year was a second. Um, and I became truly terrified because I was like, oh, this is how you blink and suddenly you're getting a gold watch and you're 60 years old. Uh, I became truly terrified of routine. And I think that's what I was celebrating during you know the decade that i was on the road was every day was a year and uh every year was a lifetime and uh, because you know different cities different towns different shows all, all of that stuff um but of course that changes when uh, uh, uh when you have to have a system that can replicate it over time and and i suppose uh part of the reason I'm fascinated with this topic is I, I am only now almost 10 years into, you know, or over 10 years into doing podcasting and may, and that being the primary source of income along with YouTube stuff uh, and building out a team, realizing like, uh, no bro, you got to have a routine. Um, that's, that's how it goes. And, um, uh, I, I, uh, sorry, I, I I literally just had that epiphany and wanted to share it in 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 the moment. But but like I guess you you Justin, do you do you have any aversion to the rhythm of a routine or? I mean, at this point, it's mostly just survival. Like if I want to get stuff done, I gotta I gotta know to do it because otherwise I will fall into just scrolling around. I mean, I I will I will fall into the uh, 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 you know, when you're the master of your domain, that means that you also can screw around a lot. Right. And you can also like write it off as like, this is when my mind is at its most fertile. This is when I'm really exploring the space. And to a certain extent, I can make myself feel good about that for a period of time, but ultimately nobody cares unless I'm making stuff. And if I'm going to make stuff, then I have to make time for it. And if I'm going to make time for it, I have to lay out the day. Uh, and now I can run over that time. I mean, here to be totally honest, I'll tell you what the, the, the big thing that unlocked all of this for me was going to sleep at a certain time and waking up at a certain time. Like that, that was a game changer. It unlocked like uh, any and everything that has kind of come after it up to and including what I think has been an intensely up uh upgraded work uh ethic um you know health benefits and uh uh just i think being a more focused person uh, uh none I, of it i think would have happened if i didn't i i can really relate to your talking about when you're at dell brian because i remember there was a point where i had i'd moved into my i moved into a, my condo i bought my first condo and I had been, I was fully independent, like I was writing magic books or whatever, and my time was my own. I could do whatever the heck I wanted to. I could wake up whenever I wanted to, do whatever I wanted to. And I remember the day I got my keys from like my realtor and I walked in and I set them down on, you know, the table. And then in my mind, it's a, I fast, a year later, I walk in the door and I set my keys down and there is like a missing year. There is a year that is just missing. I can surely I can look through my you know emails and figure out what the heck I was doing, but 
But that time jump and that one year in my head was instantaneous. And that was the moment I said, I need a bigger goal. And that's when I decided I wanted to do TV. Because I said, I, I, the easy stuff I'd mastered, I could make a living, not have, to, not have to have an alarm clock and I could get by. And I'm like, this is a problem though, because now I've got to aim higher. And that's when I had to have every day wake up with a focus. And for years, you know, for almost 10 years, the focus was TV, 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 which helped me a lot and helped me figure out my schedule because I woke up every day and everything fit around that. I knew like the most important things I would do would be anything relating to that, et cetera. As the pandemic started, you know, I'm in this sort of weird point in my life where I have enough, I've written enough books. I have, you know, you know, I have a, you know, book deals in place for the next several years. And I'm in a very comfortable place as a writer where I know, I know what my book will be next year. I know what my book will be the year after. I know what my books are going to be, you know, that are already under contract for several years out. But I don't spend most of my time writing. I spend a very small time of my writing. 90% of my time is spent doing Andrew time stuff. And that was dangerous, particularly in as we go into lockdown, because every day becomes the same and it becomes Groundhog Day. And that's where I'm like, I need a thing. I need a thing to sort of fixate my life around. And it was lucky for me was like the opportunity to open AI came up because I'm like, okay, now I know when I get up, you know, I know what my focus is. I know what I'm doing today. And then also I watch my calendar magically fill up with meetings and stuff. And so as far as time management, I think step number one is what is the goal? What is the focus? What is the thing you're trying to do? And then you figure out how to block out time from that. And that first thing could be make sure my kids get up and are, you know, are fed and are, you know, ready to be educated, whatever they do for the day. Make sure, you know, my partner has whatever she needs, et cetera. Like, and it can start with stuff like that. And then it can come into the professional stuff. But I think that's the key thing is to say each day, what is the thing I'm trying to get done? That is a fascinating holistic approach that I hadn't considered before, because when I was on tour, uh, I, I suppose I suppose I was doing that. Uh, the idea of wake up in the morning and ask yourself, who do I serve? And whether it's a certain goal or idea or whatever, when I was touring, who do I serve is the fullest schedule I can manage. And then and 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 uh, when you're on tour, you measure your wealth not in money because that burns away very quickly, but instead in um, how far out you're booked. You know, like, oh my God, I'm booked out for mm -hmm. four months. I'm booked out for six months. And then after that, I'm gonna go to these conventions where I'm gonna book out even more stuff. So, so everything was, um, wow, that's a really good way to express it because I'm realizing when I was on tour, I woke up and I'm like, who do I serve? I serve the calendar. What is the job of the calendar? To be filled, to the farthest extent out as possible with either shows or showcases uh, and uh, on and on and on and on. And, and that was, you know, 15 years. Um, and then podcasting happened and, and YouTube happened and, and I think that softened, but now uh, I can feel that ramping up where I wake up and it's like, who do I serve? Uh, I serve I serve HQ. I serve this team. I serve, you know, and mm -hmm. what are the jobs for that? You know, at any given moment, uh, I should be filling my day with either writing stuff, refining stuff or doing stuff. Yeah, I think that I think that for everybody and, and I know you meant this, too. It's like it's first it starts with family, you know, making sure that like what oh, I'm going to do, course, the end goal yes. is going to serve. Yeah. And, right. and I know you meant that. And so and, and, and I'd say for everybody, that's the thing you start. You say first is like because when you have family, you don't want to displace because sometimes people will use frustration in you know social life. They'll use work as an excuse to avoid that. But there is that's that balance of like, okay, how do I serve this best? And then it's like, okay, once I know all the noses are wiped, the lunches are packed, and whatever, or that's taken care of, or whatever, then it's like, okay, now my time is the work time and getting all this sort of stuff done. And you know, people talk about balance and stuff, and I think it's it's I look at like these concentric circles, you know, and I found that like I. I have, I think a lot of us, I think we all have a lot in common. I think that we are people who are, we can be on one hand very easily distracted and then we can be hyper-focused. And I think that that is rarer than we may realize because I think that we've gravitated towards each other because we're all good at making a thing a really good thing and spending that time and then stepping back and paying attention to the entire universe. And I think that's the key is to be able to flip that switch to go from 
hey, I'm just going to chill out and play Hearthstone and watch random Netflix stuff. And then I'm going to go, my little alarm's going to go off on my Apple Watch. I'm going to be like, boom, I got to spend the next two hours getting this thing done, this email done or this podcast done. That switch is really hard for people to flip. Most people cannot do that. And I think even when we're depressed, it's even harder because we want to do the thing that's the least stressful thing that makes us feel good. And oh, sure. I'm, you know, I'm a big believer, like, you know, like, you know, like my girlfriend, she's a writer and, and a director writer. And the problem that she dealt, same with I dealt with is when you're in charge of your own time and you're trying to do creative output, you don't know how to measure that. How, 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 when I have permission to screw around and when do I need to be writing, you know, when do I balance this back and forth? And I think that it's important. I'm like, it's important to have screw off time. It's important to say I'm off the clock right now. I've got to go let my brain reset. Um, and it's figuring out when you're doing it too much and not doing things versus when you're not doing it enough. Uh, Bryce, you recently had your schedule ruined by me personally. <laughs> 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 but, but but you also, I know, work partly from home and I, partly here. Right. <laughs> so scheduling, uh, scheduling in this environment can be pretty tough. Um, because I, I try to make myself available to as much stuff as possible because I handle all the podcasts throughout the week. Plus, I handle Scam Nation and, and those shoots, but I also try to be available for Modern Rogue shoots as well. Um, and so uh, it, it it becomes like this, like, like, for example, this week, like Wednesday, normally Wednesday, I am at home all day, editing all day because Scam Nation comes out on Thursdays. Um, but this week, I know we're trying to do some big, we're trying to do some bigger modern rogue episodes that um, you need, we need extra hands on set just to film so that there are multiple people with, with cameras and all. And, uh, and so normally it would just be like, well, either they'll try to make do without me or maybe I'll just find out and see. Uh, but, but, uh, thankfully because, uh, we've got Corey and, and Jason working on, um, coordinating that stuff. We could actually sit down actually just like an hour or so ago and say like, okay, well I am available. I can give you a couple of hours on Wednesday, but I got to know when they are because I've got, I've got editing and stuff to do. Right. Like last week, um, my editing time got cut off a little bit because we had a very early morning thing on Thursday, which meant if I wanted to get six hours of sleep, I needed to stop what I was doing, shut everything down and go to bed immediately. Um, and so, and if I kind of knew that was coming ahead of time, maybe I could have shifted stuff around a little more. So that, that kind of makes it tough when, when we're playing everything by ear. Um, but the other, um, but the, the counterbalance to that is a lot of a lot of things are flexible in terms of, of, of due dates um, and uh, you know the, the guys are able to get a certain amount of stuff done without me so um, being able to focus on deadlines that are a little soft um, and be available like that's uh, that's how it is I, I, I kind of do have to take it day by day and have a just a sense of like okay well s Friday might be a little easier we'll just keep an eye out on Friday so it, it's tough to, to, to have you know um, to not have specifics but at least trying to sketch out vaguely what the week is and keeping that in my mind um, so the calendar app on my phone does not get used very much <laughs> <laughs> in that in that yeah, Andrew. Is in the yeah in the chat. You know, somebody pointed out says I always, I find I'm always my most or do most productive work when you have a lot of things in your calendar, and that mm. that's a common that's a recognized phenomenon because mm. when you look at your calendar and like like I know I have a conference call I have to do at like three o'clock, and so I know I'm like oh okay when this ends I've got an hour an hour and a half or whatever of a block of time. Had I not had that. I might just finish the podcast, mosey around, take a nap, look for something to do, spend. And now we have the social media demon that just fills up all of our time. We'll spend, you know, mm -hmm. what are all the other reactions to the Batman? You know, like that's not going to make me smarter or wiser to know that other people thought well, it was awesome, and, too. And, and that that's true both for pleasure and for creation, because you might get caught in a perfectionism loop where it's like if, if there's no deadline, mm -hmm. you're just going to keep on going and going and going. The gift of a deadline is compromise. And in, in that spirit, we wanted to try to wrap up by the half hour. So we got four minutes left. So uh, 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 can I uh, 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 suggest that we go into picks? 
I have a, yes. I, have a, I have a pick just since I, I shared mine most recently or my my thing. But if you're kind of in a space like where I am, where you have to be a little a little more general and a little less specific. Um, I've mentioned it before, but there are, and there are a ton of apps that do this. Uh, the Pomodoro technique is fantastic for. OK, well, I know I need to get a certain amount of work done today, so I need to to do this thing on my phone so I and I keep my phone on and I see a timer and I know I'm going to be working for 25 minutes and I'm not going to go look on Twitter cuz I got this, te- this I'm seeing this thing countdown. Um so Pomodoro P O M O D O R O uh, uh wait I think there's an A in there somewhere. Uh it's a very <laughs> it's a, it's a very famous time uh time spending technique. Uh lots of apps do it. I highly recommend that. Uh, I, 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 I gotta pick. If you have the means to have a twelve year old daughter who is really interested in watching David Cronenberg's The Fly but but doesn't listen to your warnings about just how how visceral it is and just you know like yeah i get it he turns into a fly whatever uh i highly recommend it (laughs) because watching (laughs) josie who loves you know mature kind of edgy stuff like that movie holds up it's 90 minutes long it doesn't overstay its welcome the effects still make you squirm and cringe it's amazing it's great nice there's a great story you should look up about Michael Ironsides when he worked with David Cronenberg about being excited to be able to sit next to him at lunch. And Mike David Cronenberg says, you know, I had a dream last night. And he watched everybody get up and walk away. <laughs> He's like, oh, that's weird. And then David Cronenberg, and you got to hear him say, David Cronenberg tells him the dream. And then he talks about the next day, we're at lunch, we're all gathered at the table. And David Cronenberg says, I had a dream last night. Mike Arntes, and so I picked up my tray and I walked away. <laughs> Uh, my pick is High Score, the Netflix uh, documentary. I'm I'm pretty sure it's the same team as the, the toys, toys that, that made, made us, us and movies that made us. Uh, but this is a different a different beast. Uh, certainly, a lot of the same production techniques that that you might uh, love from those other documentaries. A little less of an editorial eye and and uh, uh, having the kind of different perspectives yell at each other in their own different interviews. Uh, and it's a little bit more of kind of like a love letter to, to video games. Yeah. It, it's not Do very you- rigid. It, it kind of goes off in its own story, picking metaphors that illustrate the history of the medium, which I think is very interesting. You, you know, who's doing the narration on that? I, I know I'm supposed to know who that is, but but I didn't recognize. It's me, El Mario. It's Charles Martinet, the guy who did the voice of Mario. Mario. Oh, what's funny is you said it's me. I'm like, Andrew Maine, you did it. <laughs> yes, guys, it's me. Uh, wait, so uh, did did he do all the all the other toys that made us and movies that made us? Charles Martinet. Because it sounds, yeah, did he do? I don't was know he about that. The signature voice for that, because I I thought it was that but maybe it's uh maybe it's not we're gonna we have we have the technology uh (laughs) donald ian black did the toys that made us oh wow okay then uh then yeah i i was i was unaware i guess they have similar sounding voices (laughs) yeah i did yeah are you sure that the same producers are uh no that was maybe it's maybe it's not yeah 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 i don't i think it's different um it doesn't oh. feel different to me, but yeah, they certainly do feel different. Um, I, I I guess I thought that they had uh, I, the, I the, had the, the pop I, culture lock. I yeah. had the same thing in my mind. Yeah, I, just looking at very quickly at the IMDb of the of the series. Oh, those are directors, but none of those are from the other. Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing any pedigree here between these two. Wow. Actually. All right, then then yeah, uh, that was just a total fake news by your boy. <laughs> Mm. Fake news. Uh, my my productivity tip. I again, like I get to sound. Oh, great, Andrew. Writing that's wonderful. But Notepad, Notepad. Whether if you're on your iPhone, use your Notepad. Your Android, whatever. Just make notes. Just start with making notes. Just make a note. Even if you're like, ah, I got this in my head. Like, just get in the habit of making notes. And also, you can learn little tips and tricks for like you know doing the bullet points, checklist stuff like this. It's just a way to keep things on task and sometimes like i've had a thing where someone oh could you do this thing for I'm like yeah yeah sure 
And then I go, I'm like, oh, I got to do this. Then I go back, I look at a note, and maybe I wrote one sentence, and it clarifies it for me. And like now, I know how to make it. You know, uh, you know what's funny is I, I guess I've been doing that. I, I write myself emails, like like uh, four or five emails mm -hmm. a day, and they're dumb, nonsensical emails that says, you know, don't forget to love that thing. <laughs> and yeah. it's like, what? dear Brian, what? <laughs> dear Brian, nice hair. Yeah, oh, right. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Anything else? No, I'm good. It's been after one minute. Ah, yeah, we we did good. We did good. Good stuff today, everybody. Hey, that's gonna do it here for us. Uh, guys are gonna. Oh no, it's not. Uh, guys are gonna be back in a half hour to do happy hour. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, uh, and uh, happy hour will be a little bit short today, I think. Oh, there sure. you go. Keep an eye out for that. But hopefully, start on time. Half hour, happy hour. Oh, happy half hour. Happy half. Happy half. You're going to have to figure Mildly it out. Mildly amused folks. hour. Yeah. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>